Hello, nice to see you. As with my last few videos, I'm focusing on strictly black history events and people this month that I never really learned about in school. Black history in my experience was always confined to a month and was usually centered around the same few events and people. I've linked the few videos I've done so far this month below in case you wanna check them out. So in my experience throughout school, we never really talked about the highs and the achievements of the black community. If someone was to never look any further, that may leave them believing that there really were none. We already talked about one place earlier this month that proved the black community is not only strong and resilient, but could be amazingly successful and prosperous. That was on the discussion of Black Wall Street. Who knows how much this neighborhood could have grown and inspired if not for its destruction by the white residents on the other side of the tracks. Today, we'll be talking about another place and event I never learned about in school, and this is one on the other side of the United States map. That place is Seneca Village, and it was located in New York City. It was located on a section of the city that would one day become the famous Central Park. Seneca Village was founded by free black Americans in 1825 and was the first such community in the city. It didn't take long for the little community to grow in size, as slavery in New York ended in 1827. Like the community which housed Black Wall Street, this one was packed with some necessities that they could rely on instead of being made to rely on things from the white community. They had three churches, two schools, and two cemeteries. While Seneca Village only covered about five acres of land, it was far from the shanty town that the media referred to it as. It was a middle-class community that had its necessities alongside established streets. What made this little community even more impressive was that it wasn't only black citizens who lived there, but German and Irish immigrants would come to live there as well. Despite the racial harmony within their community, they were still described as squatters and scoundrels by the media and politicians. Who knows why they were referred to as such, considering this community very obviously wasn't just thrown together and very clearly had adequate housing but the media, am I right? In fact, by the mid 1850s when the area was taken over, there were 264 residents and around 50 homes. One thing to keep in mind is that New York, like other states, had processes and laws in place to make voting difficult for anyone but white men. One such law was that in order to be eligible to vote, African American men had to own at least $250 in property and hold residency for at least three years. In part because of this, there were only about 100 eligible voters in New York in 1845. 10 of those voters lived in Seneca Village. In the 1840s, ideas started forming in the minds of the city's elite members. They saw that places like London had these big fancy parks like Hyde Park to stroll around in, and they wanted something like that too. They were eyeing the area where Seneca Village was for their new development. See, not only was the area occupied by Seneca Village, but other small settlements had also taken root, like the Irish settlement of Pigtown. All these settlements, with all these people on the land they wanted, that wouldn't work for them. This is part of the reason that the media and politicians had been doing so much in regards to framing the settlers as squatters living in shanties. By the time the 1850s rolled around, the city started planning their park, and on July 21st, 1853, New York City acquired the land they wanted through eminent domain. This meant that they could take the private property and use it for public use with a payment to the landlords and residents. While they did receive payment, many residents felt like their property was undervalued. In all, some 1,600 residents were displaced. They had until the end of 1857 to vacate. To this day, we still don't know much about life in the village when it was around, or what ended up happening to all of the residents that left. Seneca Village, like most things of its kind, was left out of history books and largely forgotten until the release of The Park and the People, A History of Central Park, came out in 1992 and it discussed the community. Since then, there has been a lot of interest in the site and research started taking place there in 1997. After imaging tests and use of ground penetrating radar over the years revealed all that it could and helped the researchers narrow down where Seneca Village was, a few different digs took place. The last, in 2011, ended up uncovering the foundations of a home, 
part of the original All Angels Church and household items like a kettle, the sole of a shoe, a pan, and even fragments of Chinese porcelain. In honor of the residents who were relocated, there is a plaque commemorating the site that was installed in February 2001. I really wish I had known about this when I visited New York City and Central Park in high school so I could have checked it out. I absolutely love reading anything historical and if I could have been there in the area and seen the artifacts, yes please. In addition to the plaque and signs, there are also plans for a statue honoring property owners in Seneca Village, specifically the Lyons family. The Seneca Village project was founded in 1998 and has since had the mission of raising awareness about the existence of Seneca Village and educating the public. Well, that's all I have for you today. Thanks for joining me to take a look at Seneca Village. I'll catch you next time.